a greater wisdom than all the wisdom of Solomon. He said, you're blind. You cannot see the truth. You're deaf and you cannot give the truth. He said, I'm the truth. I'm the light of the world. I'm the sign. All right, week number two of Elijah. We're gonna jump into 1 Kings chapter 16 and 17. If you've got a Bible and are finding your place there, two things I wanna say uh, as we venture in. Number one, first I want you to treat God's word this weekend and throughout the Elijah series as a mirror. Look at your own life, your own tendencies, some of your own sins and failures in ways that God needs to strengthen you. Number two, then use it as binoculars. Start to look through the storyline and to see your marriage see your parenting, see your family legacy through generations, see your experience in church, look through it and see what you find in culture as well as in politics. And what we're doing right now, we're gonna set up the story of Elijah and we're gonna look at five generations of a family. Uh, the main characters in the Elijah story is Elijah, the man of God, Ahab, the king, Jezebel, the queen, they are demonic and evil and at war against Elijah and God. We're going to see generational patterns. And as we look at five generations of King Ahab's family, I need you to look at yourself and your family. Look back as many generations as you can to see if you don't find patterns. Generationally, there are families that are cursed and families that are blessed. Those that are cursed, it is increasing brokenness one generation after the other. For those who are blessed, it is degrees of health one generation to the next. As we look at this family, I need you to look at your family. And I, I'm just going to read this quickly to get us to 1 Kings 17. But we're gonna look at five generations of King Ahab's family. We'll start with Ahab's great, great, great grandfather, King Jeroboam. All of this is summarized in 1 Kings 16. If you want more, the study guide will give it all to you. Here's what it says about him. 1 Kings 14, 16, he sinned and he made Israel to sin, that's it. Next generation, Ahab's great, great, great grandfather, King Nadab. It says in 1 Kings 15, 25 through 26, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and he walked in the way of his father, like father, like son, for good or bad. Men, if you are a bad man, you will have bad sons and grandsons. If you are a good man, God's man, you could have good sons and grandsons. Our future is held by our fathers. I'll see you men on Wednesday night. In addition, we then read of Ahab's uh, great, great grandfather, King Basha. First and foremost, he killed his father, Nadab, and murdered all the descendants of his grandfather, Jeroboam, in 1 Kings 15. In addition, it said of him in 1 Kings 16, two through four, God said, anyone belonging to Basha who dies in the city, the dog shall eat, and any one of his who dies in the field, the birds of the air shall eat. Not even a dignified burial because these men are without dignity. In addition, uh, we are told of Ahab's great grandfather, King Ella in 1 Kings 16, eight through 10 and 13, when he was drinking himself drunk, Zimri came in, struck him down and killed him because of all the sins they caused Israel to commit, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel to anger, to anger. Ahab's great, his rather his grandfather, King Zimri, we are told in 1 Kings 16, 15 through 19, he reigned seven days. That's all God could stomach of this man. He reigned seven days. He burned down the king's house over himself with fire and died because of the sins he committed doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Ahab's father, King Omri, 1 Kings 16, 22 through 26, he built Samaria. God told them Jerusalem is supposed to be the center and he instead created Samaria as the center. He created his own nation, his own government, his own demonic pagan religion. By the time of Jesus, the Northern and Southern kingdom had Samaria in the middle and the Jews would walk an additional few days around it to avoid it. Jesus walked through it and met with a woman from Samaria at a well. It was a detestable place from this man's legacy. He built Samaria and he did more evil than all who were before him. And then we get to King Ahab. First Kings 16, uh, 29 through 33, he reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He took as his wife Jezebel, that means unhusbanded, 
and Baal is my prince, she's demonic, daughter of King Ethbel. Ethbel means with Baal. So they worship the demon gods, Baal and Ashtara, and serve Baal and worshiped him. Ahab also made a sacred pole. This was an ancient phallic symbol for people to arrive at their worship place and have all kinds of illicit sexual activity. The result was they then would take the children born of their illicit activity and sacrifice them to demon gods. Because when you worship sex, you murder children. A choice is the name of a demon. Goes on to say, Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord of the God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So this is a five generation family. And what you're gonna see in a moment is Elijah steps on the stage to deal with this man. Just a few things I wanna say before we jump in to meet Elijah. Number one, not everyone has a good heart and not everything gets better with time. See, every once in a while, somebody will do something horrifying and someone will get on television and say, they had a good heart. No, they didn't. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Overflow of the heart, the hands act. That's why a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And if you have bad fruit, you're a bad tree. And you don't have a good heart if you have a bad life. In addition, time doesn't improve anything. Sometimes the longer you wait, the worse it gets. Number two, we evolve externally, we devolve internally. During this time, they're making cities, religions, technological progress, and there is moral deterioration. That exactly explains Western culture in this very moment. The, the progress is out there, the regress is in here. Just because we're making progress culturally doesn't mean we're making progress morally. And the progressive myth and lie is that there's progress out there and progress in here. As things get more advanced out there, people become more primitive in here. Number three, things can always get worse. I'm assuming and guessing, particularly if you're still listening to my sermon, you have been disappointed with recent elections. <laughs> huh? Now that being said, what we tend to think is, if we can just endure this season with this politician, I'm sure we'll get another one and things will turn around and get better. Here we have five successive kings that get increasingly evil and worse. Increasingly evil and worse. Number five, number four rather, government is usually the problem, not the solution. If your hope is in government, you're adorable. <laughs> what happens here, we have five generations of kings ruling and that is the problem, not the solution. In addition, number five, politicians come and go, but the demons remain the same. What we tend to think is if we just got a new politician, then we get a new environment or culture. Well, if the old demon is working through the new leader, you get the old culture. This is five generations of leadership, but every one is led by, guided by the same demonic forces to do the same evil. It's really interesting in our day, a lot of people are frustrated because it doesn't seem to matter who we vote for. There seems to be this inevitable gravity within politics that takes everything southward. We call it the, the swamp. Like there's this invisible group of people that are just determined to wreck our culture. And I would say it may not just be people, it may be principalities, powers, and spirits. And the Bible talks about a swamp. It talks about it in Revelation, multiple places. It uses the word, the pit. And in context, out of the pit come demons that then rule in governments and create cultures. I'm telling you that in addition to the swamp of people who are employed in politics, so are spiritual forces at work as well. In addition, um, Satan and God are both working to create generational legacies. Here we see in Ahab's family, five generations of evildoers. It's going to say in the last book of the Old Testament that God was going to send Elijah, who you'll meet in a moment, and that his ministry, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, would be to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and turn the hearts of the children to the fathers so that people wouldn't be cursed. 
God is wanting to send the Holy Spirit to create generational legacy for life and Satan is sending demonic forces to create generational cursing and death. What kind of family did you grow up in? Which line were you a part of? What kind of person are you? What kind of life do you have? What kind of marriage do you have? What kind of legacy are you leaving? And then lastly, number seven, nations have politicians, God's kingdom has prophets. You're gonna meet them in a moment. We just read, five generations of politicians, nothing changes until there's one prophet. The point is this, we don't need more politicians, we need more prophets. And what a prophet does, they speak against the politics. Politicians tend to be Ahab's and also Jezebel's by nature. Those who are politicians and Ahab's, they do what everyone wants, they're passive. Those that are Jezebel's, they control and dominate and no one gets what they want. What they hold in common is God never gets what he wants. When a prophet shows up, it's not about the politician getting what they want or the people getting what they want, but the Lord getting what he wants. That's the issue. In our churches today, I'm just telling you, way too many politicians in the pulpit, way too many. What do people want? What do they think? How do I keep my job? What does the board say? What does the Ahab on the internet say? What does the Jezebel in the women's ministry say? What does God say? Amen. A prophet hears from God and speaks for God. That's their job. Now we're gonna meet a prophet. His name is Elijah. And we're gonna look at the war behind the wars. And the entire backdrop of Elijah is spiritual warfare that we see people having conflicts and behind those people are powers, principalities, and spirits. When you see conflict in the seen realm, there's conflict in the unseen realm. First Kings 17, one, here he comes. This is the man of the hour. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, the dude walks out of the woods, gets right in the face of the king. Didn't even schedule an appointment. And he said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives. He's like, this is between you and God. I didn't write the message, I just delivered the mail. Here's what the Lord says. Before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain. This is a big deal. If it doesn't rain, you're hoping for dew. If you get neither rain nor dew, you end up with Phoenix. Okay, that's, this is a problem, okay? <laughs> for three years, except by my word. So let's look at the war in the unseen realm and then the seen realm. In the unseen realm, the conflict is between Baal and Asherah and the true God. Baal and Asherah are demonic false gods. They're fallen angels that are being worshiped as God. Baal was considered the chief male deity, Asherah the chief female deity, and they are at war against God and the prophet of God. In addition, Baal is considered the God of the rain. He oversees fertility and crops. And if you want it to rain, you pray to Baal. What God is doing here, he is picking a fight with Baal. God is not an Ahab, he doesn't mind a little conflict. And, and, and what he's saying here is this, my God rules over your God. I'm guessing Elijah had on his camel a little bumper sticker that said, my God can beat up your God. That's just how I see this going. <laughs> Our God controls the rain. He's like, my God controls your God. See, Satan is not equal to God. God is over Satan and demons. And so this is going to prove to the people that they have been worshiping the wrong God and the real God is in charge. In addition, has God been patient? Let me speak to my progressive friends, or should I say my progressive friend? I've lost a few, but my progressive friend. <laughs> what people do is they read the Bible and the Bible says that God judges us and then we start judging him. Oh, that was mean for him to kill people and end lives and judge people and not allow people who are in love to just pick their gender and get married and do whatever they want. Point is, we're not to judge God, God is to judge us. And let me ask you this, at this point in the story, has God been really patient? How many of you, five, five generations, 
How many of you, you look at your enemy and you're like, look, if your family doesn't turn it around in five generations, I'm gonna do something. <laughs> God waited five generations. And then we just read that King Ahab got to rule for 22 years. <laughs> We've only got four year terms. I mean, imagine, <laughs> just imagine. 22 years of Biden and then Hunter. You're like, ah, okay, ah. <laughs> You wouldn't be like, you know, Lord, you shouldn't judge people. You'd be like, Lord, you need to judge people as soon as possible. <laughs> In addition, it's not going to rain for three years and God's still being patient. I, I would say five generations, 22 years, plus a three year grace period. God's very, very patient. He's been patient with you, hasn't he? Been patient with me. And it's not because he's okay with you. It's not because he tolerates you. There's a difference between God's patience and God's tolerance. God isn't tolerating you, he's being patient with you because God doesn't want any to perish but all to come to eternal life. In addition to the war in the unseen realm with Baal, Asherah, and God, there's the battle in the seen realm between Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. Ahab and Jezebel, they're the politicians. They're the politicians. They have all the power, they have all the money, they have the staff, they have the army, they have the kingdom, they have the castle. We would say they're winning. Some would even look at them and say, they must be good people, God has blessed them. Satan, quote unquote, blesses people too. What we know of Jezebel, the queen, she is domineering, controlling, and overbearing. We'll deal with this a little later in the sermon. What we know of Ahab, he is passive and cowardly. Then entering into the scene is Elijah. He shows up here for the first time. We don't know anything about this man. He literally just showed up for the first time in all of human history or the Bible. We know of Jezebel's family, her father was Ethbel, he was the king of Sidonians. He was a high priest to the demon goddess Asherah. We know about her family. We know about Ahab's family. We just looked at five generations. We know nothing about Elijah's family, nothing. We don't know anything about his life history. We don't know his credentials. Did you go to school? Did you go to Bible college? Did you go to seminary? We know nothing because it's not about Elijah. Elijah's about the Lord. Elijah doesn't spend a lot of time talking about himself. He's talking about his God. Here's what we do know. His name is comprised of two parts. Eli means the strength of the Lord. He's strong. Number two, Jah, my God is Jehovah. Here's what his name literally means. I live by the strength of my God. Amen. Here's what he's saying. I'm spirit filled. That's what his name means. I live by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's literally what his name means. His hometown is Tishba in Gilead. Some people ask, where is that? We have no idea. It's such a small town, it doesn't exist. It has no historical significance except for this. He literally walks out of the woods because see politicians, they walk out of dinners. Uh, they walk out of fundraisers. Uh, they, they walk out of spas. Prophets walk out of the woods. He just walks out of the woods. He has no driver's license, no secure, social security number. He has no digital footprint. He pays cash for everything. Like this guy does. Now, let me say this. Have you ever seen the show Yellowstone? Okay. No, 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 I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying you should. I will, however, refer to one character, my favorite. It's Rip. So there's a guy named Rip. Rip has no driver's license, no social security card, no digital footprint, and no birth certificate. That's, if, if, if he got saved, he'd have to change his name to Elijah. That's what I'm telling you about Elijah. <laughs> he's not soft, he's tough. And he, nobody knows it, he just shows up and he gets it done and then he's gone. So, he is going to take Ahab to the train station. I'll just, a little spoiler alert, where? <laughs> Where the story's going, just where the story's going. Now, what we know of the region of Gilead, it was rugged, rough hill country, tough people. 
uh, remote, rural, way out there. These are the people that live off the grid. These are the people that hunt and fish and, and they live off the land and they don't want anything to do with politicians. They wanna be left alone. If you wander into that area without permission, you're not coming home. It's a dangerous place. That's where the outlaws would run and the law wouldn't chase them. That's where Elijah, the man of God, chose to live. He's a rugged outdoor mountain man. Give you another show. Have you seen the show Alone? The show called Alone. The story of Alone is this. They take a bunch of people and they drop them in a remote location. They're only allowed to bring with them minimal supplies. They need to find water. They need to hunt and fish and gather. They need to create housing, start a fire, and they live alone off the land. You can tap out when you're injured or emotionally, you can't take it anymore. And the winner is the last person who has not quit and they are alone. Here's what I'm telling you. Elijah would have won that show every single season. <laughs> this was not for him like a television experiment. This was a lifestyle. He's that guy. He's that guy. We have too many soft men in Christianity. Just let me just rant for a minute because I haven't yet. But like, um, <laughs> when he comes face to face with Ahab, Ahab says, "You're the troubler in Israel." Yeah, somebody's got to do it. I mean, if the world is as bad as we think it is, somebody's got to have the ministry of causing trouble. If the devil's giving us some trouble, somebody needs to give him some trouble. That's Elijah. Uh, also too, he just didn't look the part. He was not, you know, he was not soft. You look at him, he didn't look like the average kid coming out of, you know, homeschool co-op, right to Bible college, skinny jeans, you know, frosted tips, <laughs> crying through the song, falsetto. He wasn't that guy. He just wasn't. Here's what it says. There's a guy named Ahaz Ahaziah, and uh, he hears that Elijah's put out a prophecy, which is a hit on him. And, and, and they, they weren't, the people weren't sure. They're like, yeah, this guy showed up and he said, you're dead. Who was it? And they're like, we don't know. He didn't have a name tag. We don't know. So he asked, what kind of man came to meet you and told you these things? They answered, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather. And then he said, oh, that's Elijah the Tishbite. <laughs> Here's Elijah. He sees a moose, he kills it, he eats it, and he wears it. That's Elijah, <laughs> okay? He shows up in church, like, oh, I hope you're on our team, you know? Uh, <laughs> and then later on comes a guy named John the Baptizer that comes in the power and spirit of Elijah. He's Elijah 2.0, says that he, Matthew 3, 4, wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. These guys don't look the part. They don't tuck their shirt in. They don't say please and thank you and yes, ma'am. And they don't use their turn signal and you can't hurt their feelings. <laughs> now here's, here's what's interesting. So you've got Ahab and Jezebel, the politicians, and you've got Elijah, the prophet. And this is going to be the head on collision. Ahab and Jezebel have money but Elijah has the anointing. Ahab and Jezebel have power, but Elijah has the anointing. Ahab and Jezebel have religion, but Elijah has the anointing. Ahab and Jezebel have a staff and an army, but Elijah has the anointing. You've got to decide, and you've got to determine in your heart, would I rather have everything minus God or nothing plus God? They had everything minus God. Elijah had nothing plus God. The most important thing in the life of Elijah is the most important thing in your life and mine. It's the anointing of God. It's the presence and power of the person of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't live a natural life because he lives by a supernatural source. Don't disobey God. Don't disregard God. Don't defy God you lose your anointing. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your anointing. You can live in obstinate rebellion against God. The most important thing you have is your anointing. Some years ago, um, worst season of my life, uh, God had given me a 
wonderful opportunity to preach his word for a long time, called Grace and I to resign, we did. And I was in my mid forties, five kids sitting in my house. I thought I was praying to the Lord. I think the Lord would say I was complaining to him. And I was like, Lord, I, I, I don't have a job. I don't have a future. I don't have a platform. I don't have a staff. I, I don't know what, where we're gonna live. I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I, I'm looking at the future. And honestly, I have some anxiety. And here's what he said to me. He said, son, when God speaks to me, he calls me son. That's how I know it's my father. He said, son, wherever you go, my anointing will go with you. And that's all you need. Amen. Yeah. Right? That's all you need. Yeah. So, I'm now eight and a half years from the lowest point of my whole life, reaching more people on the earth with Bible teaching than at any point of my whole life, okay? And my wife is still smiling. My kids love Jesus and I got grandkids coming. Okay? And so people would ask, what's the secret? There is no secret. Just stay very close to your father and his anointing will provide protect for you. That's the key, that's the key. All right, now we'll look at what happens next. We're, we're one verse in, um, okay? <laughs> so that was the introduction. Now we're gonna look at separation for preparation. Uh, 1 Kings 17, two through six. And if you wanna study the story of Elijah, just start in 1 Kings 17, just read through 2 Kings 2. That's what you need to do. And the word of the Lord, the most important thing is the word of the Lord. There's a lot of noise. Gotta open your ears and hear the word of the Lord. Okay. Sometimes you're like, well, I'm gonna ask a lot of people. Actually, you should probably just ask one. And if he tells you, you have your answer. See, we believe in the word of God. We believe that God spoke the word, world into his existence through his word. Not only did God speak the world into existence through his word, his son, Jesus Christ, came into the world as the word of God. We believe that God works through his word. Once Elijah gets a word from God, he obeys. The word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself from the brook, by the brook at Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Obey the word of the Lord and you will walk in the anointing. Obey the word of the Lord and you will walk in the anointing. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. What we see here is separation for preparation. Some of you right now, you're in a season like this. You're like, God's called me out of one thing, but he's not called me into the next thing. I'm into the time between the times. I'm not sure what is to happen next. He's going to be here for an extended period of time. During this time, there's no indication that God said anything else to him. Sometimes God told you to move, find a new city, find a new church, find a new job, find a new season. And you're saying, okay, Lord, what next? And he says, well, I've, this is separation for preparation. And he'll tell you what's next when you're ready. Cherith means either to cut off or to cut down. And here I believe it means both. He's been cut off from society and God is going to cut him down. It's kind of like the military. When you go into the military, what they don't ask is, what's your personality? What are your allergies? You know, what do you like to do? What makes you feel fulfilled? What would make you happy? What's your personal vision? Okay, great, we're gonna add to that a few requests from the military. Instead, what do they do? They take you to boot camp. Separation, preparation. Cut off and cut down. And then they rebuild you as a soldier. That's exactly what's happening here. This is Elijah's boot camp and special forces training. And it happens in solitude because he's meeting with the Lord. The same thing happens to the Lord Jesus, 40 days in the wilderness. Same thing happens to the apostle Paul, three years in the wilderness. Here it is Elijah's time in the wilderness. And let me say this friends, if you've been cut off and cut down, it's not because God is done with you. What he is going to do, he's going to rebuild you and he's going to resend you. He's not done with you, he's preparing you. Don't just sit there, sit there and ask him what he is seeking to do to make you ready for the next season. God hasn't abandoned you. Maybe he has separation and preparation for a new sending and calling. 
I had 18 months out of ministry and out of the public eye. I had my time at Cherith. It was the best thing that God ever did for me after giving me Jesus, my wife, and kids. It was the hardest thing that ever happened, but it was the best thing. Sometimes God cuts you off and cuts you down to build you up and send you in. Now, what we learn here as well about our God is this. Number one, our God prophesies. He says, no rain for three years. Says it through Elijah. Our God knows and rules the future. History is under the sovereign hand of our God. Our God knows the future, he reveals the future, and he controls the future. That is such good news for us. As you look at the world, you're like, it seems like it's out of control. Well, there is one who is in control, and thankfully, he's our father. Amen. Number two, our God not only prophesies, he protects. He says, son, go here. As it gets drier, your life is gonna be in greater danger. I'm here to protect you. And so what God does, God protects him. And number three, God provides. There's gonna be no rain or dew, but for a season, there's gonna be a creek for you and I'm going to deliver your food. Now, ravens in Leviticus chapter 11 are unclean animals. And here's what's amazing. God can take that which is unclean and use it for something that is clean. God can take someone who is evil and use them for good. God is not evil and God doesn't do evil, but God is above that which is unclean and evil and he can use it all even for that which is clean and that which is good. And so the ravens deliver the food. Just, can you, just think of this. I don't know, I just, I wonder, cause I'm peculiar, but I wonder if on the raven, there wasn't like, you know, a uh, logo, like a DoorDash or Postmates <laughs> or a Uber Eats. This is the beginning of delivery uh, right here. And so the, the, the raven brings his food. And it's kind of like the days of the Exodus where every day God provides. And Jesus tells us that he still does this. Give us this day our daily bread. We're asking him to provide. He may provide through the grocery store or your father. He may provide through the restaurant, but know this, it all comes from your father. And then he's there for a season and then his brook dries up. The question is, what do you do when your brook dries up? First Kings 17, seven. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. You can go a few weeks without food. You can only go a few days without water. Here, the drought is severe. Crops have died, livestock have died, people have died, the economy has died, the nation is dying. This is God slowly being patient, giving opportunity for repentance. And what happens is if there's no repentance, there's no rain. Unless you get rid of the sin, I'm not going to bring the blessing. See, the blessing and the sin can't coexist. So God is saying, until you get rid of the sin, I can't send the blessing. No repentance, no rain. And here, this brook that he has been sustained by, it dries up. Some of you know exactly what it feels like when your brook dries up. We've all been there. Some of you are there right now. Like I had a job, and it dried up. I had a company and it dried up. I was in a church and it dried up. I was in a marriage and it dried up. They were our friends, that relationship dried up. It's not flowing anymore. You wait. Well, maybe it'll start flowing again. It's not flowing, it's dried up. We're all gonna hit those seasons and stages in life where the brook dries up. That which sustained you is no longer able to sustain you. We'll hit this next week, but two things you need to do when your brook dries up. You gotta pray and then you gotta pivot. You gotta pray and get the word of the Lord and then you gotta pivot. Lord, where do you want me to go? Where's the new brook? See, for us, Arizona, new brook. Trinity Church, new brook. Real Faith, new brook. You people, new brook. A lot of life here. A lot, there's a good water here, I'm yeah. telling you. This is a good place yeah. to be. This is a good place to be. So our brook dried up, pray, pivot, find another brook.
find another city, find another church, find another job, find another company, find another way. That's what happens to them. It was a season of blessing, but all seasons of blessing come to an end. Don't mourn, don't doubt God, don't curse God, don't abandon God, thank God for the brook, and then trust God for the next brook. So let me go from the story to the story behind the stories. Now we're gonna go deep. Question is, and this is the question of the sermon, are the Jezebel, Ahab, and Elijah spirits active today? Here's the prophetic insight for the interpretation of the Elijah narrative. My thesis is that these are not just three people, but in addition, it was spirits working in and through these people. And though these people do not continue to exist, the spirits continue their work. With Ahab and Jezebel, there was a demonic spirit at work in and through each, with Elijah, the Holy Spirit was at work in and through him. Just like the Holy Spirit continues his work in our day, so those spirits continued their work in our day, as I call it, new days old demons. Let me deal first with the Jezebel spirit because what is happening, as soon as I sent out the first sermon, most, most popular sermon I've preached in 27 years, by the way, God anointed that because people wanna know what is going on. But immediately the first criticism will come from the church folks and the religious people and the Ahab pastors. And the first thing they will say is, no, 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 that is an old story and it's not one that continues. And I tell you this, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened, but what always happens. And people will come and go, but the spirits at work behind the scenes, they continue. So let me just answer this refutation and correct this error. First of all, we know that Jezebel was not just a woman, but a spirit. How do we know? Jesus Christ tells us. A thousand years after Jezebel lived, there was a church called Thyatira in Revelation chapter two, a thousand years later. Seems like everyone in that church was an Ahab, tolerant, passive, and there was a Jezebel, controlling and domineering. Jesus shows up and says, don't tolerate what I don't tolerate. Here's what Jesus says. Revelation 2, 20 through 24. I have this against you that you tolerate. You listen, you tolerate. If you don't disagree, you tolerate. If you don't turn the channel, you tolerate. If you don't block the website, you tolerate. If you don't say no to the guy who wants to take your daughter out and you don't like him, you tolerate. Evil doesn't stop itself. So someone needs to get in the middle. You tolerate that woman. Her name is Jezebel. Like, what is she doing here? She got a thousand candles on her birthday cake? No, it's a different woman. Same demon. Same demon named Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. She's a false prophet and she hires 850 false prophets. And the moral of the story is there's always more false prophets than true prophets. And is teaching, oh, they'll teach. And if they can't teach, they'll blog. <laughs> teaching and seducing. It's all about sexual sin and lawlessness and tolerance my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols, to do evil. I gave her time to repent, just like the five generations, 22 years, plus the three years of Ahab. Jesus is like, I've been patient with her too, but this, this demon doesn't ever change. But she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. All true or false today, it seems like there is a demonic onslaught of sexual anarchy that's inclusive of going after our children. Yeah. Jezebel's gotten into children's ministry. See, everything God creates, Satan counterfeits. Church has kids ministry. So does Jezebel. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her are thrown into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. See, repentance and tolerance can't coexist. Tolerance is the counterfeit of repentance. 
and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. Do not hold this teaching, what some call the deep things of Satan. Number one, Jezebel is not just a woman, she's a spirit. Number two, Ahab. This is the most difficult one to prove, but I will. Ahab is not just a man, it's a spirit that worked through a man and continues to work. And let me say this, the Jezebel and the Ahab spirits can work through men or women, men or women, men or women, but they, they have a codependent relationship where one uses and abuses the other. In my experience, it is mainly men who have the Ahab spirit and mainly women who have the Jezebel spirit sometimes from sexual trauma, which has opened them to bitterness and generational torment. Last week at Real Men, I did the 28 signs of the Ahab spirit. This week I'll do the 29 signs of the Jezebel spirit. If you wanna to go to realfate.com, it's there. But let me tell you a little bit about the Ahab spirit. Let me give you six reasons why I believe Ahab is not just a man, but a spirit working in and through a man. Number one, he's a counterfeit king. Everything God creates, Satan counterfeits. Jesus is a king who rules over a kingdom. Ahab is a counterfeit king ruling over a kingdom that was supposed to be God's kingdom. And everything that Ahab is doing is literally anti-Christ. It's exactly the opposite of everything that God commanded him to do. And so what he is, he is a counterfeit king and he is an anti-Christ. Number two, he's a counterfeit priest. Not only does he rule the government, he and his wife Jezebel, they set up their own demonic religion where God is forbidden, but Baal and Astra are promoted. And so what we see in his life and ministry, he is a counterfeit priest. The Bible says that there is one mediator between us and God, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is our great high priest, that he mediates between us and heaven and he brings heaven to earth. Ahab is a counterfeit priest with a demonic counterfeit religion. He mediates between earth and hell. And he literally brings hell to earth. Complete disregard for God, disobedience of the Bible and death of children. Number three, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that human beings live by one of three sources, the spirit, the flesh, or the demonic. Those who live by the spirit are like Elijah. We'll talk about that in a moment. They manifest the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those who live by the flesh, they're short-sighted, they're self-indulgent, they're self-destructive. They make foolish, stupid decisions and they cause themselves and others pain. Those who are demonic don't accidentally cause pain, they intentionally cause it. They don't make mistakes that cause trouble, they purposefully plot and plan to do evil. They're very calculated. Zero times do we see Ahab living by the spirit. Occasionally we see him living by the flesh and we continually see him living by the demonic. Everything he does is literally anti-Christ. When he kills, he and his wife, when they kill the prophets of God, that's demonic. When they close all the Bible teaching schools, that's demonic. When they forbid the worship of God, that's demonic. When they set up high places to worship demons, that's demonic when they encourage everyone to pick their gender on a spectrum and have sex with whoever, wherever, however, and whenever they want, that's demonic. Now they would win election today, but they're demonic. In addition, number four, his wife Jezebel, true or false, she's clearly demonic. She is. We just established that. The Bible says that in a marriage, the two become one. And let me say, there's no division between this husband and wife. They are fully aligned. They do everything in alignment and it's always evil. They have an unholy alliance. They have a demonic soul tie. And so if she is evil and demonic and he's fully aligned with her, he's demonic. That is, this is for a guy who needs to hear this. I don't know who it is. You know your wife is evil. Why do you tolerate her? Do you not know that if you tolerate her, you are joining her in doing evil? Why do you let her say that to the kids? Why don't you get in the middle? 
Why do you let her do that to your family? Why don't you stand up for what's right? For the man who needs this, I, I see it in my, I see it. For the man who is passive like Ahab, you are allowing harm to everyone that God has given you responsibility to protect. I know why, I can see it. You know that she's hell. And if you deal with her, she's gonna give you hell. And so what you do, you let everybody else live in hell. That's an Ahab. Some of you men, you put up with things from your wife that are fully demonic. This is for another guy. It's because she has trauma. She was abused, raped, assaulted. And you know that she's broken and unwell and you can see it in her family. It's generational cursing. And you have compassion on her and you feel sorry for her, but you won't get help for her, which means you truly don't love her. Because if you love her, you will lead her to become the best version of her. You will not tolerate her to allow the least healthy person in your life and family to set the culture of your legacy. A Jezebel spirit, I got one more. A Jezebel spirit and Ahab spirit work together. For some of you men that have the Jezebel spirit, you're domineering and overbearing, you're sexually demanding. And because it's marriage, you think it's okay, but it's violence. Some of you, your wives don't wanna sleep with you, but they're afraid to say no to you. And they're being abused by you. There are different ways that the Ahab and Jezebel spirit work together, but it's always this codependent, unhealthy relationship, sometimes with a lot of explaining away what needs to be driven away. The Ahab spirit, in addition, is demonic. Let me just pray for you. Father God, I pray against the enemy of servants, their works and effects. And God, as we get into darkness and we're trying to turn some lights on, God, I pray against the Jezebel spirit. And some right now, Lord, they're aware that that's them. We're gonna deal with that in a moment. For some, Lord, they realize that was a spouse, a parent, a previous dating relationship, controlling, manipulative, fear-based, sensual, punishment, intimidation, control. Lord, we pray against the Ahab spirit, passivity, cowardice, indifference, letting the lie stand without saying the truth letting evil advance without getting in the middle. Lord God, please give us the spirit of Elijah that we would realize that we're either gonna have conflict with evil or conflict with you. And Lord, may we have the humility to surrender to you and the courage to engage evil, to get in the middle, to protect. I pray for the men, God, that they would have a heart to protect and build up and bless women and children. God, our whole culture is run by Ahab's and it is dominated by Jezebel's. And so Lord, I pray starting with your men that there would be a fresh anointing an Elijah anointing of the Holy Spirit and that Lord God, men would love you and that they would be active and not passive, but they would be active in a way that wasn't controlling, but was contributing to others being blessed in Jesus name, amen. Let me pick up my thought here. Um, Another reason I believe that Ahab's spirit is also demonic. Uh, number five, he worshiped and fully devoted himself to the worship of demonic false gods. And number six, and then I wanna get to my point. Uh, this is my introduction. So number six, um, <laughs> here's what it says in 1 Kings uh, 16, 29 through 23. It says of Ahab, he did evil. And that same word is used in the Old Testament of another man named Saul. And it says that Saul was tormented by a demonic spirit. That word evil is the same word. That, that evil was done by Ahab through a spirit that tormented him. And he's not a victim. He opened himself to it through unrepentance, unbelief, habitual sin. In the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. He's the worst man 
who had ruled in the history of Israel to that point. And then here's, to me, this is, this is the clear case that Ahab is not just a man, but a spirit. First Kings 21, 25, there was none who sold himself. Who'd he sell himself to? It wasn't the Lord, it was the devil. You can, so, you can sell your soul to the devil. There is none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He's the Judas of the Old Testament. Satan came to Judas at some point and said, how much for you to betray Jesus? He said, 30 pieces of silver. And later, Satan possessed him. Ahab is the Judas of the Old Testament. He is a Jew who betrays the God of Israel for a price. Jezebel's a spirit, Ahab's a spirit. Elijah also operates by the power of a spirit, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the hope in the story, right? Greater is he, Holy Spirit brings a verse to mind. Greater is he, Saint, you know the line. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Right? That's the Holy Spirit. His name as we established, Eli, strength of the Lord, and Jah, my God is Jehovah. As we've established, his name means I live by the power of God. He's saying I'm spirit-filled. He's also a prophet. Second Peter 121 says, no prophet spoke except by the power of the Holy Spirit. He can't be a prophet without the Holy Spirit. In addition, he shows up on the scene and he says, there will be no rain until I say so. Let me just tell you, you need God. Like if, if you determine the weather, that's not you. I mean, we live in Arizona, we've all tried, right? God, cool down. Light rain, nope, doesn't obey. But when he speaks, God speaks through him. If you can cause the rain not to fall for three years, but then in an instant, you'll see it coming up, call down fire from heaven, you have the Holy Spirit. How do I know? We've all tried also to call down fire on our enemies. <laughs> it never happened. Jezebel's a spirit that is controlling. Ahab is a spirit that is passive. Elijah is a spirit that is assertive. Let me, let me talk, because now I know some of you have got a question. And so if I publish the book on this, it'll be a chapter, but three levels of demonic influence. Right now, some of you, you're like, okay, what a, how, how much influence can a demon have? Well, some people are possessed. They are fully controlled to where their personality and the demonic mesh into a blurred line. There are people in the Bible that manifest different personalities and powers and names and Jesus casts demons out of people. This is the demonic counterfeit of being spirit filled. Being demon possessed is the counterfeit of being spirit filled. These people tend to be very powerful and sometimes even clairvoyant. And sometimes they get diagnosed with what used to be called clinically multiple personality disorder. And now it's been changed to dissociative identity disorder. And what that is is, that's one person, but there's a lot of persons there. Different names and personalities and likes and manifestations. Sometimes it is trauma. Sometimes it is mental illness. Sometimes it's demonic. And sometimes people say things like, I hear voices in my head. What's wrong with me? It may be spiritual. Number two, you can be oppressed. This can be internal or external. If it's external, it means you're so oppressed and this could be for a believer. Only an unbeliever can be possessed, but a believer can be oppressed. Even Jesus was oppressed. He was in the wilderness for 40 days like Elijah, and at the end, he was exhausted through a demonic battle. Nothing got in him, but it was against him. When you have this, you end up like Elijah. There's going to be a moment coming up in a few weeks where Elijah has a battle with the 850 false prophets of Baal, calls down fire from heaven, Jezebel and Ahab threaten him. It's a demonic oppression. He runs a hundred miles, goes into the woods, lays down and says, I just want to die. And God shows up not to rebuke him, but to comfort him and takes 40 days to nurse him back to health. He's so exhausted from the oppression. I'm telling you this, preaching is exhausting because not only do people show up to church, so, too, so do powers, principalities, and spirits. 
There's also internal oppression. This can be for a believer. It doesn't mean you're controlled or owned, but it means through habituation, sinful living, rebellion, indulgence of the flesh, you've opened yourself up to internal influence. There are two occasions I'll give briefly. One is with Peter. Peter says something to Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. Satan. Peter's like, that's not my name. No, but, <laughs> but, but what you allowed, you allowed Satan to say something to your mind and you spoke it through your mouth. That was internal influence. There's another occasion in Acts 5, it's debated, but there's the early church and there's a husband and a wife, Ananias and Sapphira. They lie to God, they steal from God. Peter looks at them and he says, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart? Number three, tendencies. You are not possessed or oppressed, but you have some personality traits and tendencies. Ahab is passive. Some of you, so let's deal, let's deal with Ahab just briefly. He's, he's passive. Some of you, he's passive. Some of you are more shy. You're more quiet. You don't have a lot of opinions. You don't say a lot of words. It doesn't mean you're an Ahab, but that would be your personality tendency. Some of you are high control. If you're in a room, you're in charge of everyone in the room. Okay. If you chuckle, their husbands didn't. Just pointing that out. <laughs> My wife laughed because she's an Elijah. Um, And sometimes you've gotten bad teaching. Some of you grew up in really bad Bible teaching churches. You're like, you had legalism and rules and control. So you think just being legalistic, domineering and overbearing is godly. No, it's not. That's Jezebelian. And some of you have been told, well, if you're a Christian, you're just always nice. You never have conflict. Everybody likes you. You just love everybody. And every day is a rainbow and a pony and a cupcake. Okay? No, that's not true. You had bad teaching. Some of you grew up in dysfunctional family systems where the family was passive or controlling. So let me deal with three kinds of people. Here's the point, this is where I've been trying to get to. Um, and so what can happen is there's, there's passive Ahab, there's controlling Jezebel, there's assertive Elijah. Let me take these three people who did exist in history, the spirits working in and through them, and then go to the level of clinical personality. Okay. And so within this, what can happen is if you don't understand the assertive personality by the power of the Holy Spirit, like Elijah, you're only left with these two options. Now don't raise your hand, but how many of you have bounced between Ahab and Elijah at various points in your life? How many of you, you were passive, 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 you got hurt, used and abused, you made an inner vow, I will be in control, nobody's gonna hurt me, I'm gonna be the dominating one. So you went from Ahab to Jezebel. And some of you, it was the opposite. You were Jezebel, high control, everybody's like, I hate you, there's the divorce papers. You're like, oh my gosh, now I'm alone, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna be Ahab. I'm not gonna say or do anything, because I don't wanna be alone. We talk about these three personalities and these three kinds of people. So you've got to figure out who you are. Are you controlled by fear, driven by fear? Always worried about what someone's gonna say or think or feel or do or what could happen. Are you controlled by entitlement? You feel like you've been through a lot, so you deserve a lot. Are you controlled by victimhood? It's not my fault. Are you controlled and manipulated by flattery? If, because you're insecure. If somebody flatters you, pays attention to you, they control you. Are you controlled by emotionalism? If somebody's upset with you, do you do whatever they say? If somebody's happy with you, do you wanna do all you can to make them happy, regardless of whether or not that makes him happy? Are you controlled by pleasure? See, Ahab was, his wife was beautiful and sensual, so he put up with her crazy, Single guys, write this down. I've said it before at men's. I probably shouldn't say it now, but it is true. Crazy in bed and crazy at Costco are not equally enjoyable. <laughs> Some of you are like, she's crazy in bed. No, she's crazy. That's not awesome on your birthday with your grandma. And some of you are controlled by pleasure. You like what you get from that person, so you tolerate their 
dysfunction. Here's, if, you have an, if you're an Ahab, right? I'm telling you guys, especially men, don't be an Ahab. But you avoid leading, sacrificing for others, being uncomfortable, hard work, rejection, and positive change. Let me ask you Ahabs, who or what do you tolerate that you know is wrong? And do you see who you are allowing to suffer harm because of your passivity? Your wife, your kids, your income, your church, your extended family. Jezebel's a spirit of control, arrogant, aggressive, manipulative, domineering, overbearing. If you're a Jezebel, here's what you like to control. Do you know what you like to control? Two things, everyone and everything. If, if they will tolerate it, you will control everyone and everything. You will seek to control relationships, sex within your marriage, money, conversations, physical environments, information, platforms, and narratives. You wanna control it all because you wanna be God and sovereign. Here's what you hate. You hate authority. You hate losing. You hate leaders and you hate being corrected. Heaven forbid that somebody would rebuke you. You are going to war. And if that doesn't work, you are going to whine. And if that doesn't work, you're gonna say that they're a Jezebel trying to control you and you're a victim. How do I know? 27 years of my life. Tactics, here's what Jezebels use. Controversy, lies, conflict, oppression, threats, seduction, and death. They really like to rule at home. They really like to rule in church. The internet has given Jezebel a brand new power. Every time Elijah's trying to do ministry, Jezebel's trying to do anti-ministry. Jezebel's always doing anti-ministry. She would say that her ministry is anti-ministry. Today on the internet, Jezebel loves what's called discernment, accountability, and demanding that people walk in the light and be held accountable. And Jezebel will try and control churches that she doesn't attend, ministries she's not a part of, and leaders she's never met, and states she's never visited because she wants her control to be tolerated anywhere and everywhere. It's demonic. And then she gets a lot of support because on the internet, all the Jezebels find each other. And Jezebels love the church, they love ministry, and they'll weaponize the Bible. See, Satan shows up, just let me just verbal process for a minute. Satan shows up to Adam and Eve and he misquotes the Bible, he weaponizes it. He shows up to Jesus, misquotes the Bible, weaponizes it. Jezebel loves this book because it's a sword. And if you don't know how to handle it, she can use it to kill you. Jezebel will say things like, the Lord told me. I have a word from the Lord, the Holy Spirit. I had a dream, I had a vision, an angel showed up. I was reading the Bible and God told me this verse is for you. It's always controlled. It's always controlled. Because if you love the word of God and Jezebel wants to control you, she will quote the word of God and weaponize it to control you. What, what Jezebel hates, Elijah's, really hates Elijah's. And let me say this, if you tolerate Jezebel, she gets stronger generationally and it becomes a generational curse. God showed me this today. I just, I learned this today as I was praying. God spoke to me and said, go to 2 Kings 11. Okay, I go to 2 Kings 11. You wanna see what I saw? You wanna hear what I heard? Yes. Jezebel had a daughter. Her name is Athalia. Her son became king in Israel. Now we're repeating the generational pattern. Previously, it was Jezebel controlling her husband who is king. Now it's her daughter controlling her son who is king. Jezebel loves to overmother and boss around the father. What happens is he is the king, her son, but Athalia really 
she rules and reigns from behind the throne. He's the head, she's the neck. Her son dies in battle one year into his kingship. This means that one of the male heirs in the family will take his place. So she has every potential successor to the throne in the family murdered. So that she, Jezebel's daughter, becomes the queen of Israel. Jezebel's daughter is the only woman in the history of the world to rule the nation of Israel without a king. See, what happens with the Jezebel spirit, it doesn't get diluted over generations. It gets multiplied over generations. It gets stronger. That's why the Jezebel spirit is one of the hardest to rebuke and to break because it wants control, which means it's not going to give up control unless the Holy Spirit takes control. The third category, there's passive Ahab controlling Jezebel, assertive Elijah. You don't need to be like Ahab and you don't need to be like Jezebel. You can be like Elijah. Elijah doesn't work by demonic spirits, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is what the clinicians would have uh, categorized as an assertive personality. It's not passive or controlling, he's assertive. If you wanna look this up, it's actually a clinical category, assertive personality. He's open and honest about how he feels, what he thinks and what he wants. If there is evil, he will say and do something. He doesn't tolerate it, but he doesn't do evil. He's not a bully, he's not picking on people. People aren't scared of him. But when there's trouble, he gets in the middle. He is honest and direct with others and overt, but he's not controlling. He allows people to know him and he wants to know them. That's why later in the story, when a guy named Elisha shows up, they become best friends. He doesn't mind relationship. He's healthy. They honor themselves and others. They stand up for their rights, but they're reasonable, you can discuss with them. They're willing to make concessions if it's in the best interest of both parties in the relationship. They have a humble confidence. See, Ahab, he has no confidence. Jezebel, she's got pride. This is humble confidence, like Jesus. And he lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are Ahabs, you need to repent of that. Some of you are Jezebels, you need to repent of that. I don't think anyone starts as an Elijah. I don't think any family starts like Elijah. I think we've got to own whether we are more like Ahab or Jezebel and then invite the Holy Spirit to make us assertive like Elijah. Let me bring the band up and we're gonna worship a bit now that I've preached too long. Um, and I've, honestly, I could probably preach another 20 hours just on this section, but you know, that's just where we're at. So, um, I'm 52, I gotta go to bed. So, um, <laughs> so in the scriptures, um, there are types and types are little signs pointing to a bigger reality. Elijah is a type of Jesus. Jesus comes as the greater Elijah. Okay. And so what we're gonna do in a moment, we're gonna release the online audience and we're gonna worship and we're gonna pray. And we're gonna repent of the ways that we're like Ahab and the ways that we're like Jezebel. We're gonna repent of the people and things that we tolerate. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to fill us and to make us assertive like Elijah. The band wants to kick in. Let me read it to you and then we'll worship together. Elijah came down from the mountains. Jesus came down from heaven. Elijah came from the little town of Tishba Jesus came from the little town of Nazareth. Elijah and Jesus were both prepared for ministry by being alone in the wilderness. Elijah received the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. Elijah was a prophet for God. Jesus is God, the prophet. Elijah stood against one nation and some demons Jesus stands against every nation and every demon. Ahab sold his soul to the devil to destroy Elijah. Judas sold his soul to the devil to destroy Jesus. Ahab 
took Jezebel as his bride and Jesus took us, the church, as his bride. Elijah was taken up to heaven before he died. He came down one time on the Mount of Transfiguration to meet with Jesus. He's coming back one more time to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Elijah was used of God to bring down fire from heaven and Jesus from heaven sent down fire for revival. What we need is the Holy Spirit. What we need is the presence of God. What we need is the word of God. What we need is more Elijah and less Ahab. More Elijah and less Jezebel. More prophesying and less politicking. I love you. We need to meet with God. Please stand and join me in worship.